What we really need to do as a society is invest in a series of activities and, and um, areas that we've been neglecting. The average American is working longer hours today than he or she has, you know, at, at any time since, uh, you know, many, many, for many, many decades. Um, what this means is that as we have sort of over-invested in money and consumer goods and so forth, we've let other sources of wealth erode. Um, we've neglected our communities, our families, um, and our planet. So um, austerity is, is, is really not addressing that issue. We've got to uh, actually take our effort, our money, uh, and our effort to investing in the things which we have eroded because um, hollowing out our communities, hollowing out our families, uh, long hour life, uh, lifestyles and so forth undermine well-being and they um, undermine our ability to actually have a more plentiful and abundant future. One of the ways to think about it is that from the ecological point of view it's pretty clear we need a major shift to a whole new set of technologies. The technologies of the Industrial Revolution which took nature as if it were um, uh, endless and in free supply and we could pollute the atmosphere without ever paying attention to it, pollute our rivers, cut down all our trees and so forth. Uh, our technology, our economic system, the way we value things, it's all based on that idea, which is a crazy idea and, and the, the sort of the chickens are coming home to roost on that as we've defouled the climate, run down our ecosystems and so forth. To get to a new kind of production and consumption system which actually respects and restores the earth, it means we're going to have to do a lot of investing. Um, but that's investing at a, at a local scale, at a smaller scale. It's a whole different economic model than the one we've been using. We've got 26 million people who are unemployed, underemployed, marginally attached in the labor force. We'd have to be generating half a million jobs a month for almost two years just to get back to where we were before the crash. That's a level of job creation that is absolutely unrealistic. And the current discourse about how to get there is, is woefully inadequate. The current discourse is saying, number one, cut the deficit, which will further undermine demand and job growth. Plus, its view is, well, let's just try and get the economy growing and the jobs will somehow trickle down to the people who need them. That's not the way ma mass unemployment, which is what we've got today, has ever been solved. And to add to that, there's a dimension of this that hasn't been recognized in the conversation that this country is having which is that we have created a powerful barrier to job creation in the way we've structured hours of work. For uh, about 75, almost 100 years, beginning in the late 19th century, the country took a significant portion of its economic progress, of its productivity, in the form of shorter hours of work. So it grew, it had increasing income, but also workers got uh, shorter schedules. We got Saturdays off. We got eventually, you know, moved down to something like an eight-hour workday, the concept of a 40-hour week. Now that's a completely normal thing to happen and all of the wealthy countries went on this path. Uh, we would never have been able to reabsorb all the labor that gets displaced in the ordinary operation of a capitalist economy if we hadn't done that because productivity growth is always generating uh, a reduced demand for labor. Um, we have industrial restructuring that's going on all the time. Some products get popular, others decline. So we've, we've got to have a way of reabsorbing the people who are laid off in the normal course of a market economy. If you don't have reductions in hours, it's, it's uh, almost impossible to keep your population fully employed, which means that when we try and create a job in this country, we've got to generate somewhere between sort of 10 and 20 percent more revenue and sales for every job than uh, the than European countries have to. So it, it's a it's a real barrier to job creation. If we had shorter hours of work, if we were able to take productivity growth over time in the form of shorter hours, 
we could re-employ those 26 million under and unemployed people much more rapidly. For individuals who, who want to really secure their economic futures, I think one of the most important principles going forward is going to be diversification. Diversification of your income sources, of, of how you meet your daily needs, um, and diversification in terms of where you invest. And this gets us back to that principle of how, what is wealth and a broader notion of wealth, which includes wealth in the planet. It includes money wealth, of course, but also wealth in people. Um, if we invest in relationships with other people, that, that becomes a source of wealth. So this brings us back to the question of time use. If people are able to work fewer hours in the labor market, it means they can take that freed up time and begin meeting needs in new ways which reduce their necessity to depend on that market, that market which is going to be less stable and less lucrative. So for example, in the book, I look at people who are involved in a variety of things called uh, high-tech self-providing, but basically making and doing for themselves outside a formal market structure. They might be growing vegetables, they might be raising chickens, they may be generating electricity on a small scale off the grid. Uh, they may have solar, solar collectors on their roof or a, um, a backyard uh, windmill. Uh, they may be involved in sharing schemes, so they don't have to um, lay out as much money to get um, appliances or cars or other forms of transports because they may be sharing with their neighbors and creating economic interdependencies that are going to um, serve them well when times are a little bit rocky. In the book I have some pretty astounding new numbers on what I call the fast fashion cycle, the way in which consumers have increased the rate at which they acquire new goods and then discard them. And that, of course, was a predictable result of an economy of lots of cheap imports, uh, artificially cheap energy again. Um, and um, uh, that, that's something which, that's a, that's a lifestyle that in some ways, uh, that's a lifestyle that really has been um, stopped dead in its tracks since the uh, recession. And many people uh, have sort of permanently uh, changed the way they think about consuming um, as a result of having gone bankrupt or you know, racked up large credit card debts that they now are not sure they're going to be able to pay lost their homes, uh, had the trauma of unemployment. All of those things have had a profound impact on a big swath of the American public uh, who are now much more interested in saving than, they, than spending uh, for the first time and are really uh, have, have made changes in their consumer patterns that look like they're going to stick at least for a while. Um, if we think about how you can have a satisfying consumer life in this new world, there are two things that really stand out. One is um, if you're going to buy something, uh, buy for durability, both because it's ecologically much better, uh, but also because in the long run it will probably cost you less if you can buy something and keep it for a long time. The second is that we're going to see a switch from such a heavy emphasis on buying new to uh, much more of a balance between uh, buying things new and buying them used. And th this, is, this is a trend that's, that actually started, of course, before the recession, um, in part because people were buying so many things. There's, there's so much used stuff around, whether we're talking about clothes or furniture or electronics, or pretty much you name it in the consumer goods uh, area. Um, there, there are growing inventories of used goods, which the original purchasers don't want. And now we have lots of ways of exchanging those amongst our, among ourselves, whether it's eBay or Craigslist or FreeCycle or uh, swap meets or um, share this stuff, a whole range of um, specialized websites that allow people to get rid of things they don't want and other people to acquire them, and then all the face-to-face places in which we do this too. So 
the sort of economies of reuse and exchange are growing rapidly and I think will become a more permanent feature of our consumer environment. And that means if you love to shop, you can do it uh, without you know, putting too much pressure on your pocketbook or on the planet. If you love to buy stuff and get rid of it, you can do it. I mean, the key thing really from a, a financial and ecological point of view is how much new, uh, how, much, how many new consumer goods do you buy? If we, if we shift the balance there, because of course the used stuff is so much less expensive, we can, I think, you know, accommodate both the, um, uh, uh, you know, shopaholics as well as um, the planet and our pocketbooks.